All of our productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortuneMA.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions. challenge and I just got an email today that said they made the challenge yeah. and this is a global uh, and there are a million forty thousand wow. Wow. <coughs> pollinator gardens certified listed and so that they said that uh, is about five million acres of land that is now covered with food and everything for the pollinators. <coughs> it always happens when I begin. It'll go away. <coughs> so um, we all can can do we all can do something to add to that because I know there are other gardens like mine, because I couldn't work the computer thing to get listed. I'm not in that list, so I know there are other people who are not in that list. And there are more, even more gardens than that, but we need them all. So, we're going to praise pollinators. I got this photograph from uh, Don Conlon, who some of you may know, who is the uh, Apiary guy uh, has held all kinds of uh, uh, bee offices in the state. And the reason he let me uh, show this picture is because you can see they have the little bee baskets on their knees, pollen baskets on their knees. But they have it kind of all over. And it's because of static electricity. I did not know this, that the bees went around with enough static electricity to collect, collect pollen that way. One of the first pollen plants of the year, dandelions, <clears throat> very important. And in our Heath Garden, we had many of these. <laughs> and we, I take credit for that. <laughs> we, treasured, <laughs> we treasured every single one. So one of the things you want to think about when you're planting a garden for pollinators is throughout the whole season, you know, so you need early spring all the way into the fall. So we begin with dandelions. And these again, it's my lawn. Violets. And I just learned that 
these little violets, wild violets, uh, are a host plant for fritillary butterflies. So um, don't want to get rid of those either. A weedy lawn is a good thing. And, and actually, we'll be talking about that a little later. Um, so, so the butterflies are pollinators, which I don't think I started thinking about butterflies being pollinators until quite recently. I thought it was all about bugs, you know. Um, but the butterflies do pollinate, and so it's important uh, that we provide host plants for those larvae. Uh, because the lar butterflies will eat a lot of things, but the larvae are quite particular. So we need to know about that. This is a photograph from our very own garden this morning. Really? Oh. Those are my little tiny crocuses. And this particular photograph only has one bee in it. Really? But there were other bees in, in, the, uh, in the crocuses. These are little tiny crocuses. And actually, we saw them two days ago. Then it got cold again. But a couple of days ago, it was also very warm. And uh, a house guest we had said, look at this, look at this. We've got bees around. And Henry says they really are honeybees. <laughs> so that's very exciting. And there weren't. There's, there's Again, not a lot early, else. early. Not much else on our street. Right. So I. So these plants kind of go in uh, seasonal order. These are double blood roots, and this picture is from the Bridge of Flowers, which is one of the places to look for inspirations or new. I do not, the, the, the Bridge of Flowers has a lot of pollinator plants, but uh, I do not have all of them. Pussy willows, and as a, the pollinate, the, the pollen is not on the fuzzy parts. You know, after, after you have the fuzzy parts, there are little catkin kind of things, and those, those have the pollen on them. There are 300 native bees in Massachusetts. So all the work is not laid on the, on the wings of the honeybee. There are a lot of other creatures who are uh, bees and other things that are doing this work. Grape hyacinths. Grape hyacinths. Yes, we're still quite early in the season. I have all those leaves left in my garden from last year. I don't know quite what to do. If anybody tells me I should just cut them down, I wish they would tell me. And this is this is foam flower, Tiarella, which uh, is really a wonderful plant. It makes a great ground cover, and after the flowers come, it just has this nice, very low ground cover. But in the in the spring. It is also a pollinator. I bought these at Foster's, and they have they have multiplied. So this is primrose. What is it called? Primula vulgaris. And so I have a bunch of of these, and they don't mind water. My garden is particularly wet, and so everything you see is also water tolerant. You get an extra bonus there. And and this is in a in quite a wet spot and it's come back uh, every year so it's doing very well. Bluets? Does anybody have bluets? You know I always think of them as being out in the field. But okay, so some people have bluets. I think they're so beautiful. And I, we did have them up at Heath, but don't have them here. They still be? I was surprised to find out that was, I don't know why, it just didn't look 
pollinator is cooling. Now this is a different kind of, of the stilby. It was a brand new um, variety that I saw on the, on the garden tour, which is really very pretty. And they also uh, do pretty well in our wet garden. We all know this, yarrow. What else is it called? Yarrow yeah, did well on your yard last year. Oh yeah, yarrow, yarrow. Well, our yarrow grows in the in the drier. Spots. Yeah, mine didn't do that well. They did, but not well. It's acalea. Hmm? Acalea. Thank you, sure. acalea. <laughs> <laughs> now this is really interesting plant, and I wouldn't have thought it. Where do you go? You know, if you're a little bee. This is um, uh, this is button bush, Cephalanthus occidentalis, and um, I, we bought this for our garden because it is said to grow right into the river banks and into the water. So it's very happy in our garden. So this this is these are the little balls, and so that's you get a little slightly bigger idea of the now, does that, is that close to the ground or so is it's, tall? it's about this high yeah. you know maybe maybe three feet and um, and and it has so it blooms again we're still in the early spring this is pretty early now I don't remember who it was possibly my husband who said, you cannot grow rhododendrons in this garden because it will kill the honeybees. I might have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, surely not. Um, so I did some research, and, and I found out that, in fact, um, honeybee honey gathered from, from a rhododendron is poisonous. Oh. It says their nectar is toxic for honeybees, not for bumblebees. But honeybees don't care about going into the rhododendrons. They eschew rhododendrons, so they rarely go to rhododendrons. And we can all have rhododendrons even if we want honeybees. The bumblebees really love them and do a great job in yeah. pollinating. This, not very colorful, this is um, a Lindera benzoin spice bush. And I, I'm growing this uh, along with a neighbor of mine. We went shopping together and we each bought this bush because it is the only host plant for spice bush butterflies. Or, yeah, spice bush butterflies. And so they they lay their caterpillars here, their little larva, and and this is the only thing that the larva can eat. Now I haven't seen a spice bush butterfly in my garden. Yes. And I and actually I haven't yet seen any kind of flower on this either. So it's been in the garden about three years. I mean, three years. This is a this will be the third year. And I haven't seen any flowers yet, so I don't know what they're like. And and also, um, I was reminded that a lot of these butterflies do have three generations over the course of spring to fall. And and there are some. I don't have that list. Uh, there are some butterflies that the larva actually overwinters, even here. And that's why you're not supposed to clean up too much because they're hiding under there. Would they be hiding under the leaves? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And wherever they can be protected, oh, yeah. even through the bitter winter. So I don't have to rake. <laughs> that's right. Now, does this need a lot of sun, or can it be grown in the shade as well? Uh, this this is growing in the sun. It, it gets this it gets, gets a lot of it's sun. It's mostly sun. It's not, and not and this is in one of the drier spots in the garden. So I believe it's tall. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is what yeah. I'm sorry? The bush is shade tolerant, however. Oh, oh, good. Thank you. And there's male and female. Well, that's what I was oh. wondering if, if we, uh, we don't So I was just thinking couple. when you said your neighbor, I hope one of you has a female and one of I don't male. know. Yeah, we don't know. I have that problem. They didn't tell us that at the Hadley Garden Center. Oh, shame on them. Well, so yeah. did, do you have both? I think I finally do. Okay. <laughs> do you ever see any flowers? They're tiny. Oh, they're tiny flowers. Well, and they are spring flowers? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So on like the there's one in the energy park, a large bush. Oh, okay. There's only one. And does, oh. it, does it flower? So, uh, does it need to flower to feed the butterflies or the larvae? Oh, probably not. Yeah, so the, they're going to eat the, the butterfly would know this is this is good to eat even yeah, if it isn't as pretty yeah, as that's a good point. So this is the larva, oh. and <laughs> the whole idea is, of course, it will one? scare the birds away, and they won't eat it. <laughs> so. I'm sure they will. <laughs> And, and and there there are other larvae that have similar uh, you know kind of uh, costume that they wear. One is and I and I have had this. Uh, one one larva looks like bird poop. <laughs> you know and and I had I was looking at this thing and I didn't want to touch it, but I was looking at it, looking at it, and looking at it, and trying to decide what this thing was on a, on a branch, but it was, um, uh, now I'm going to forget the, what butterfly it was, but you can look at it. <laughs> Google it. Google it. But isn't that funny? So I got, I got this photograph. I have never seen this. Uh, I got this photograph from Bill Benner, who is a big butterfly expert in uh, Sunderland, maybe? I'm not sure. Nearby, nearby, and he's a, he's a great guy. He has a million uh, orchids as well as gardens for butterflies. So, do you recognize this? It's kind of not a great picture. It's elderberry, and so I have uh, elderberries in my garden. And um, they also take wet. They don't necessarily need it. Because we had elderberries on our road, and they, that wasn't terribly wet. If anybody else has any thoughts on that. So, and now you can get fancy elderberries too with interesting foliage and stuff. Alliums. Think of all the places for the little bees to get there. Mm -hmm. so Honey there. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Liatris. Mm -hmm. And the, so this is uh, this is a new kind. There are different kinds of liatris. Uh, uh, like this this might be blazing star. Um, so there are different forms, but they all are good for the bees, all kinds of bees, and other insects, I mean, because it's not only bees. We always have to remind ourselves. The actress is a perennial? This is a perennial. Yes. Haven't, I, don't, I haven't shown you any, any uh, annuals. So my neighbor has hollyhocks. And I found out that hollyhocks are. I found out lots of things in in the last few years because before then I wasn't really paying attention that much. I was just planting what I wanted. <laughs> and this is uh, Monarda or uh, bee bomb, and you can see there are little bees there, actually big bees there. Big bees. Yes. And so I have. Uh, a number of spots of Monarda, which doesn't seem to mind getting wet either. There's another. And and actually, no, the hummingbirds love this too. When we lived in Heath, we had planted uh, a bunch of things along this erstwhile uh, patio, 
and we could sit at the kitchen table and, and watch all the hummingbirds come yeah. to the Monarda. Yeah. And coneflowers, echinacea, so the butterflies like it. And if you look at a, at a nursery catalog now, I get the Bluestone nursery catalog, and there are like 20 kinds of echinacea. And a lot of them have just wild millions of petals and they look like they've got crew cuts up here and all kinds of weird things. But what, what the plants, what the, what the pollinators want is they want to be able to get right to where the, the, the nectar and the pollen is. And so, so simpler plants are better than some of those really crazy ones. So we don't have to go out of our way for that. Another echinacea, another bumblebee. I love this plant. This is a, a, um, a Mexican sunflower. And it can get quite big. There was a house uh, here in town, and they had this huge plant covered with these flowers. I said, wow, that's fabulous. And uh, I found out it is a, a uh, Mexican sunflower. So there, uh, you can see, I have, I have a, this isn't mine, but I do have a lot of echinacea. And it's just such a great plant, because it spreads, and it's no trouble, and it's good for all those pollinators. This was uh, on a garden tour I took. And Coreopsis, and that's a little bit of uh, Russian sage over there. I went to um, I went to McDonald's once during the summer, and I parked the car. And there were three Russian sage plants there, and a million uh, bees. I was astounded. So now uh, I try to have uh, Russian sage, although I think where ours is planted has to be moved. Where is it planted? It's behind. <laughs> it's behind the uh, um, yellow twig dogwood. Oh, okay. Which is growing too big anyway. So this again was was a nut this was a whole hillside planted with uh, with the uh, pollinator plants. And of course this is something else to remember is if you have a bigger spread of a single plant, it's better than having, you know, a little plant of echinacea here and a little bit of Russian sage here. You know, try to have good good clumps. This is Rudbeckia. My neighbor gave me Rudbeckia. She didn't tell me quite how energetic it was. So if anybody here wants some Rudbeckia, I can help you out. <laughs> so this is again on a, on a garden tour, but that's Russian sage. Isn't that fabulous? <laughs> Actually, this, this place where we were was um, a place that did uh, daylilies, and they hybridized all kinds of daylilies and everything. Where is that? I knew you would ask. Well, what state? I don't know. Well, this might have been... It's in the United States. Let's start there. It's in the United States. Um, this might have... Not Seattle. This is, this is not in Iowa. No, no, oh, no. This is this is a couple of years oh, ago, never mind. and I I have to look it up. I don't remember where we were. Never mind. So I get to go on these great tours, but then I forget what I saw where. Yeah. I mean, I can I can go back and check the pictures because they're by the year. Okay, and everybody knows this. This is uh, Asclepius. This is a uh, butterfly, so this milkweed, milkweed, and, a, and there are different milkweeds. It's a type of milkweed. It's a type of milkweed, it's and it's slow. Milkweed. It's only about a foot tall. And it has a good, it has a good long season. 
So we obviously are in summer. Um, this is scabiosa. What was that? That's a scabiosa. It's a pin cushion flower, mm -hmm. and this was a, another new variety that was added. Very pretty. You have lots of choices. Mm -hmm. So this is the bridge of flowers, obviously, mm -hmm. and this is Simisifuga, which has changed its name. Does anybody know the new name? I don't remember. The name. You got it written down as black and coal ash. Yeah. Cool right, ash. but it's, but that's the type. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Is yeah. it actia? So this is so hold on. in. I'm sorry. Actia. Actia. I think that's right. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. So so this here it is growing happily in full sun, full baking sun on the bridge of flowers, and. Here it is growing in deep shade under our apple tree in Heath. So it doesn't seem too fussy, and it's a big spreader. Even in the shade like that, it was really, I had to keep cutting it back. These are zinnias and uh, the, the publicity for them said specifically designed for the bees to make a beeline right for that uh, center where the pollen and the uh, nectar are. This is a, a, a friend's garden. I just love all those zinnias. So this is a person who who makes bouquets and sells them, which is very, has just beautiful things. Does anybody here grow uh, uh, sunflowers? Did you know that they are medicine for honeybees? So, um, you, you all, I hope you all know about the Bee Fest at the Second Congregational Church in uh, Greenfield. This year it's going to be on June 1, and uh, there are all kinds of events, lots of things for the little kids, and, uh, and they have some lectures. And sunflowers. Lynn Adler at UMass has done this research on uh, honeybees. And she says that they know how to medicate themselves and protect themselves from nosema, which is a big uh, important disease, I mean, disease that really kills a lot of bees. But the pollen from these old-fashioned kinds of don't, you know, don't think every sunflower, you know, they have all these new sunflowers that don't have any pollen so that you can have a bouquet and it won't shed pollen all over your table. So, um, so they not, so th I'm, I'm, I'm going to read this. So uh, her research showed that sunflower pollen and sunflower honey can both help bees suffering from Nosema serenae, a pathogen that can kill the bees in a little more than a week. And she said that the honeybees, she said she's an expert researcher and she said that the honeybees are able to diagnose their disease <laughs> and they seem to keep a pharmacy so that whenever there is illness entering the hive they can just take it out of the pharmacy and feed the sick bees and uh, not die. Um, and at that, uh, just because it was the same, uh, the same program uh, at the, the Bee Fest. She had a colleague there that day who was talking about um, research. They went, uh, do you remember when there was that terrible hurricane down in the Springfield area? And it just cleaned out everything. And so they went to this uh, virgin land. It was a tornado. And, hmm? A tornado. tornado. It was a tornado. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, they did a test about what happens when you plant a lawn. 
because a lot of people really want their lawns. So they did a test with, uh, they had people plant a lawn. They couldn't use any herbicides or insecticides, but they could plant this lawn, their lawn, and and uh, the, uh, the university sent people to mow it on their own schedule. Some lawns got mowed once a week. Some lawns got met, uh, mowed every two weeks and some lawns got mowed every three weeks and they said that the everybody was very happy with lawns that were mowed every two weeks every once a week was too much I mean nobody even likes to mow the lawn so they were happy that that two weeks was enough time for what some might call weeds would come up in the lawn. And so she said that um, if you had a non-herbicide pesticide and unfertilized lawns and you mowed it every two weeks, you would end up with 64 varieties of pollinator plants in that lawn, uh, including honeybees and native bees. There was great cheering in the church, so um, so it, it's it's really quite fascinating, you know, uh, to to think what what is in the air around us and how things move. So she she got high marks for her research. Um, okay, this is Physostegia, obedient plant. This is Chelone turtle head, and I have a close-up so you can see. And uh, apparently, this also does extremely well in, uh, in wet. Where I have it growing in my garden, it's, uh, it's growing next to a, a viburnum, and it is wet there. And this, this is as tall as I am. And when the Northfield Garden Club came to visit, they said, what is this extraordinary plant? I said, oh, it's just turtle head. But nobody had ever seen turtle head at the vast height that this is. So, and I can only think, somebody, I said, is it because I bought all this wonderful soil from uh, Martin's Farm? And, uh, they, uh, some, there was an expert there that day, and she said, no, it's the water. She said, it's because it's really wet. And this is Joe Pye weed, which, which is now embracing my meadow root. And meadow root, so uh, Joe Pye weed, of course, is a great pollinator plant, but it's, uh, you know, you don't think of these things when you're planting. I, ha I planted a couple of little shoots of uh, meadow rue. And meadow rue is this plant, which I'm sure you've all seen. And it, it's very tall, very tall. And, and, uh, and it's, it has quite firm stems. And the top is covered with little tiny purple plants. I think it comes in another color. Maybe it also comes in white. But it is, and, and it, it's just a wonderful plant. But it's very fine. It has these little tiny stems, even though they're very strong. And the meadow, the uh, Joe Pye weed, and now the meadow root are cohabitating. <laughs> 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 goldenrods, there are a hundred species of goldenrods native to the United States and it blooms for a long time into the fall uh, and it does not cause allergies. I mean, I think we all know now that it is not goldenrod that causes allergies, it's ragweed. 
And this is an aster. I'm not going to be able to tell you what kind. There are a lot of asters, and they're all good for pollinators. This is uh, on the Bridge of Flowers. Again. I was on the committee. I had to take a lot of pictures of flowers <laughs> on the bridge. Now, so we haven't talked about uh, annuals, but there are annuals. Um, and just as a, as a sample, Cosmos, which I love, is a great uh, pollinator plant. And also, raspberries are a great uh, pollinator plant. And blueberries are a great pollinator plant. However, I have to read this because I won't be able to tell you the right way. Uh, blueberries are not pollinated by honeybees, but by solitary bees that use the buzz pollination method. In order to release the pollen, solitary bees are able to grab onto the blueberry flower and move their flight muscles rapidly. <laughs> causing the flower and the anthers to vibrate, dislodging the pollen. So pollen involving vibrations is called buzz pollinations. Honeybees cannot perform buzz pollination. <laughs> About 9% of the flowers in the world are primarily pollinated using buzz pollination. So uh, I got I got that information, but they didn't say what plants, other plants, besides blueberries, did that. Dill. So I have a little little herb garden, and uh, dill, of course, usually comes back all by itself. But we went uh, uh, on a garden club trip, and we went to this woman's garden. And it was a huge vegetable garden. And all throughout this garden, there was dill growing everywhere. Getting a little out of hand. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns, but she, she did it purposely, purposefully. Planting dill in your vegetable or flower garden will attract beneficial visitors and repel pests. In a vegetable garden, dill benefits members of the cabbage family, corn, cucumbers, members of the onion family, and lettuce. Do not plant it with carrots and potato, tomatoes. Dill attracts wasps, hoverflies, tomato hornworm, that's why you don't want to plant it near the tomatoes, and uh, honeybees. On the other hand, dill repels aphids, mites, cabbage loopers, and squash bugs. Dill is also one of the few annuals that you can plant with fennel. And apparently fennel prefers to live alone. <laughs> I do. Oh, I have to I have, I have, I have to start going through the stuff. Okay, so there's a, so there's low bush and high bush, and there is the dill, and it's got some keys uh, on it. So now we're coming to the B Spaces Award. So uh, this is the very first B Space Award. And it was given, uh, the Bee Space Award is given to different, uh, different gardeners. So there are residential gardens, there are business gardens, there are a, a lot of different gardens that can get a, uh, uh, an award. So this is the very first award, and uh, Carol D. Lorenzo, who is the uh, head gardener at the Bridge of Flowers, was given this. 
Uh, and uh, Molly Cantor, so a lot of you may know, who's a wonderful potter up in, uh, in Shelburne Falls, she designed the, uh, the prize there. And uh, so Carol, Carol uh, got the award for the uh, Bridge of Flowers, and it was given to her by Deval Patrick, our former, who was uh, governor, who was also a beekeeper. So, um, I think, so I wanted you to be able to see that. And I have brought uh, uh, the, uh, the thing to fill out if you want to apply to be a bee space garden. So, so you, there, there's three or four awards given. You know, one in each in each category. And I have the uh, form that they are using. And some of you will recognize that sign, which is uh, on the. Um, Pleasant Street, where there is a new public garden in front of the John Zahn Community Center. And it is winter, so there's uh, nothing much going on there. Everything has been left to seed. Should I say anything else, Nancy? Well, that's good enough for now. <laughs> <laughs> And so you can see uh, westernmassbees.org is an, another new bee uh, website. So there's always um, a lot of uh, information. So. That's also on this sheet of paper. And which it is I a, could give out. If I yes, allow. you may give it out. Next <laughs> <Last> time. <laughs> give it out. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. And. I have here the Bee Spaces Pollinator Garden Contest, and they already, of course, have chosen uh, their gardens for the winners for this year. Um, and so, you, so the categories are residential garden, the farm, a civic or community pollinator garden, commercial space, or other, if you have any other ideas. And, um, this is done with the uh, Franklin County Beekeepers Association. So uh, if anybody wants these, I have about 10, 10 forms. Now, questions? Yes? So I uh, woke up this morning to find that my early meadow room had been eaten very lightly by squirrels. Oh. And uh -oh. I think that my neighbor is eating them. Oh. <laughs> because I find peanuts in the, the ground. And things that are well established seem to be okay. They, they manage. But do you have any root thumb for protecting tender things from squirrels? That's a tough hair? one. Hair? That's tough. Remember I get my hair cut? My hair, right? Hair? When I get my hair, hair cut, cut for deer. I put out, and, and it keeps animals. They're both rodents. Yes. Animals away, general. <laughs> what, what about, uh, well, if we're talking about deer, you know, we used to put uh, Irish Spring soap and yeah, stuff around. Yeah, Irish Spring soap and <laughs> deer. But I, I know about squirrel. Anybody else? There's a human. Human is here. Large dog. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, number two, you uh, keep on mentioning your neighbor, uh, which uh, reminds me that uh, a pollinator in my small garden wouldn't be much of a. I mean, it may be a lunch, but maybe not breakfast, lunch, and dinner without neighbors who also are planting, um, or at least. Uh, neighbors who aren't uh, killing animals. So, uh, what's your what's your sort of uh, approach to that um, 
to being an evangelist for <laughs> <laughs> to, to, to pass along, to sow the seeds uh, and, and spark interest among your neighbors. So, so, uh, so you have neighbors who have gardens. Oh, absolutely. But we also have the Bank of America who, you know, puts spray down. So what's the, uh, well, what's um, the strategy? So, well, the first thing is, are you sure they don't have a lot of pollinator plants there? I mean, what, are, what kinds of gardens do they have? The, Your neighbors. Oh, they do. Oh, absolutely. So, you know, but that's one neighbor. So how do you bring a neighborhood into oh. the act? Oh, oh, oh. So, uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, um, My dear, I, I don't there was wasn't there somebody who was trying to, to sort of connect oh. yes well oh good point good point there is a conversation going on this very minute <laughs> about a pollinator pathway and that would certainly be a way for everybody to be talking about um, having pollinator plants in their garden to consider that when they are planting their garden so apparently Northampton has a pollinator pathway and uh, there are gardeners in Greenfield who are looking to have the, the idea being that you could walk on this particular route and there would be enough pollinator plants all I mean they have to cross the street but you know that there would be a lot of a lot of uh, pollinator plants for a long stretch. So if everybody's talking about the pollinator pathway, and we're going to try and have them all talking about the pollinator pathway, yes? No, I just want to say that Please. there's an event on the 20th of this oh, month. Good. There's a flyer actually over there that about the pollinator pathway. And uh, Tom Sullivan, who was one of the people who were inspired by it, uh, to bring that idea forward. So we're going to, um, he's going to talk a little bit about his trip to Ireland, his inspiration, the, the pathway, and we're going to walk the pathway so that people can see where it is. And I, I guess in terms is of you... Is it down Davis? What? Is it down Davis? Is it, is it down Davis Street? Yes. Oh, it's oh, yeah. Davis Street. Yeah, it starts as, it ties together the uh, okay. new community center with yeah. the energy park. Oh. So it goes down Davis and then comes back up Federal oh. and goes around. And, but I was going to say to me, like, in terms of inspiring other people to do it, I think just planting things and people will see how beautiful they are and then they're all going to just do it. Mm -hmm. And maybe give them seeds from your, you know, it takes a while but seed from, from your garden, because I do that with mine. I have a lot of zinnias, fabulous zinnias. So I harvested the seeds, and I had enough to make little packets for friends. So every time someone comes to my house, I give them zinnia seeds and, and tell them to plant them. And they're excited about that. So maybe, you know, at a holiday or an event that you have, <coughs> or you can just walk down the street. Just be excited and give them a little more seeds. Even if you're not harvesting from last year, maybe a few here and there for what you purchased this year. Or maybe you have a seed swap. There are some seed swaps. And the College of GCC has a seed library, is it? You can check out seeds there. And then you can take at the end of the season. So you can talk to Coach Schneider at the GCC library and ask her to help you with that. Alex, it's all actually in the, the in book the library. library. Uh -huh. In our library. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, uh -huh. this, I'm counting on you all here. So to speak. Yeah, so that's another source. <coughs> so, more questions? Yes? I don't know um, who knows this about these, but 
you know the pollen baskets that they have on their legs? You showed us a picture of it. Do they take that pollen to feed the little bees, so to speak, in their hive? Or is that pollen, and the stuff maybe on their body is what they use to pollinate another flower is what I'm thinking, but that they actually use that because I know it has a lot of uh, good stuff in yes. it. Yes, no, they, the, they take that to the hive and they, uh, uh, and they feed. use it. They know it is, it is important food for the bees. They collect nectar as well, obviously. Yes, That's yes. And, uh, but as they fly from flower to flower, a little bit of it yeah. rubs off here and there. Yeah. Another question? There was another question. Yes? Um, to the mint plants, the flowers that come up with them, what kind of they mint? Mint? Um, like spearmint or peppermint? Spearmint, like I have spearmint. Spearmint? Tons of it, and it's very tall. It's always covered with oh, some kind of ones. You know what we All saw? Kinds of bugs. We saw <laughs> yes. monarchs. One year up in heat, oh. we had a, a bunch, you know, mint can grow like a right. weed. It certainly did oh, yes. up at our place. It, yes. That's and true. it was spearmint, I think. Right. And there were clouds. It had, of it had, it had traveled, and there was a huge, huge patch of spearmint in our field. I know that, that I've seen monarchs. And, and, and clouds of monarchs. At that year, for, nowadays. Well, there, there were for a few years, yeah. and then they stopped. Yeah. And then they stopped. Oh. Yeah. A lot of herbs will. Will have little blooms, and I notice you know, when I walk out and I see on the herbs a lot of bees. It will go to the flowering herbs as well. But that, like you're saying, the the big patches of red, it's uh -huh. like down here. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, and, and so for anything, and they learn it. it should be a sizable. It should be a sizable plant. Um, I, and I I read somewhere that there was a movement to uh, get people who had uh, a, a bigger property but didn't want to think about pollinator plants and they were being encouraged to uh, do a 10-foot square mm -hmm. and then have that full of pollinator plants. They didn't care how it looked. And, but that was enough to, to uh, really yeah, be sense. be very significant yeah. in the feeding the pollinators. And every year I get more variety, more and more variety of pollinators. They know it's there. <laughs> <laughs> and you had a question? Well, I, I see a lot of monarchs on my butterfly bush. Ah. And that's something you didn't mention, but I think of that as being a really good I, I, <coughs> I don't mention it because I have read things on both sides that butterfly bushes are good, butterfly bushes don't do anything, and so I have I have not had that question answered for me. But you you have experience with yeah. it, so so do you have a butterfly bush too? I do, and, I, I and and you get you get a lot of them. Okay. Well, that's I find that very encouraging because I have haven't known anyone, so I'm glad glad to know that. That's why I didn't talk about it because <laughs> I didn't know. It. Are there more questions? Oh, hi. I was at the uh, symposium a few weeks ago, and Charlie Iceman, uh, who's a naturalist, spoke about having host plants and it's not just the pollinators that, or the flowering plants at the pop because many pollinators will go to many different plants for their food but they have to have a special host plant that they like and they are usually woody plants they are not there are only a few herb, uh, herbaceous plants and they're they're very specific on what plants you need to have. Like willow. How many people have willow trees in there? <laughs> well, that's one of them. And uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of. But you're you're right that that the host plants are very specific. That yes, the the, the adult uh, pollinators don't don't have have a much 
wider choice. But like the spice bush, which yeah. is the only thing that the spice bush um, um, caterpillar can eat. Well, that's that point that the, once they build their cocoon or whatever it is, mm -hmm. they have to be on a certain plant. So when the caterpillar hatches, they have something to eat, and most of them only right. eat certain ones. Exactly so. Yes. So so it means it means uh, doing your own homework to find out, you know, because now there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of little books about butterflies, uh, specifically, and about what they eat and and what their life uh, is, and uh, so. So we all just have to keep doing our research for what we well, I mean, want. One other thing, I uh, after the symposium, I emailed Charlie uh, Eisman because uh, I was trying to find out something. Else. And we had a lot of trees come down in that, or branches fall down in that wind, terrible windstorm. And he said, if you could find a place, because I only have a quarter acre, to put a log, a bigger log, and then lots of other brush like the pine boughs and stuff that I have. He said, then you're creating a place for all kinds of pollinators and critters to build their nests or their whatever. And they become important food for birds and all other kinds of insects. So you need that to also balance um, right. the thing. It's not just having, I used to think it was just having flowering plants. It's not. Mm -hmm. So I, I also want to mention, and it's on your sheet, that uh, you know we've only talked about uh, plants, I mean uh, flowers and things, but in fact trees are essential. And uh, I did uh, write on on the list the ten of I think it's ten of the most important pollen trees, and uh, I had. Long, well, at the very beginning of my gardening career, when we moved to, to uh, Heath, and uh, I was walking with uh, a heathen friend of mine, and we saw these bees with green pollen baskets. They were carrying around. And I said, where does that come from? There's, it was early, early, early in the spring. I said, where, where did that come from? And he said, well, you, clearly you've got an elm tree. And we did. We did. I never knew that it was an elm tree, but he pointed it out right by the side of the road that we had this huge elm tree, and, and the bees were collecting pollen from it uh, you know, before, before there are flowers or anything else. They're, they're getting it right from the buds. So. So anyway, that's that's something to remember too. Is that there, you know, there are shrubs and there are perennial flowers, but there are also trees, and we have to we have to think about that. I suspect that you know people complaining about pollen and allergies right now might be dealing with tree yeah. tree pollen right, at this right. point. I suspect. I, I don't. Know. I was up in I was up in Colerain once, and I. Uh, I was at the top of it, well not the top of it, but I was up on a hill and I could see across this big space and it was a windy day and these green clouds, I had never seen anything like it of pollen. That's all tree pollen. Yes. Uh, I don't know what kind. So. Yes? Anything in particular to say about phlox? Is that a good pollinator? I think flocks. Yeah, tall flocks. Uh, right, garden flocks. Um, I did see it on a list, I'm pretty sure. So, because uh, garden flocks is wonderful. Yeah, I got a lot of it. <laughs> Keep your eyes peeled. Yes, I will. <laughs> so, you know, the, the number of plants that can feed the pollinators is really very, very long. And I do mention Bringing Nature Home, which is a wonderful, wonderful book, uh, and uh, and he explains why we need 
native plants, and uh, and and that way we do get pollination and we feed the birds. It's really a wonderful book and uh, and and readable. And then he did another book with um, Rick Dark, who is a great photographer. So this is a you know big coffee table book kind of thing, but it also is, is very wonderful. And the back of that book has uh, charts for, for what, what uh, plants grow in different uh, climate areas and, uh, and, and what, what they benefit. And he has little, little symbols for the different things, you know, a little little bee, a little worm, you know, all kinds of little things. And some plants service a lot of creatures. It's really very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And that's called, I now I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, but it's a book by Doug Tallamy and Rick Dark. Great book. Uh, it's gone. Have we had a good time? Yeah. <laughs>Productions at GCTV are sponsored in part by Bay State Health, providing the care you and your family need when you need it close to home. Visit them online at baystatehealth.org. Greenfield Savings Bank. Visit them at 400 Main Street in Greenfield. Call them at 774-3191 or go online to greenfieldsavings.com. Greenfield Community College, providing access and excellence in higher education in the Pioneer Valley. Visit them at gcc.mass.edu. The Hammond Family. The Hammond Family are longtime supporters of Greenfield Community Television. New Fortune Chinese Restaurant on the Mohawk Trail in Greenfield. Visit them online at newfortunema.com. Call them at 772-0838 and check them out on Facebook. Real Cleaning Services. Cleaning Hampshire and Franklin County since 1972. We don't cut corners, we clean them. Check them out online at realclean.com. Call them at 413-422-1143. People's United Bank, located at 45 Federal Street in Greenfield. You can call them at 774-3713 or visit them online at peoples.com. The Solar Store of Greenfield, replacing fossil fuels and nuclear power one home at a time. Visit them at 23 Fisk Ave. Call them at 413-772-3122 or visit them online at solarstoreofgreenfield.com. Thank you to our sponsors for supporting all of GCTV's productions.